Great. Good morning, everybody. Um, so you're not going to be hearing too much from me this morning. Some of you might be pleased to hear. So um, I'll do a bit of news first, and then I'm going to hand over the reins to Richard Williams, who's going to be talking to the manager of Life Science Street, Simon Farnsworth. So that'll be coming up shortly. But in the meantime, a couple of bits of news to look at. Firstly, Vietnam Holding has published some results, and I think they're worth looking at. And then Hypnosis has managed to refinance its debt and then fix that. Um, so we'll be looking at the impact of that as well. So Vietnam Holding first, it has been performing extremely well, really, um, but that's stalled a bit recently and it's come off in the last few weeks. And that's uh, the true of Vietnam generally. What we have seen, though, is that the discounts held up reasonably well. Um, it's maybe a little bit wider than it should be, but um, it's not widening, which is probably good news when everything else seems to be. Here it is against the rest of its set, um, peer group. It's not very big. That's the principal problem with it, really. And um, that pushes up its ongoing charges ratio. I'd like to see it an awful lot bigger. Unfortunately, it held a 30% tender offer uh, last year, and that was fully subscribed. So it did shrink. I don't think it deserved to, to shrink, though. Um, and we'll be talking about why not in a second. And um, there's the returns against the peer group. All of this is slightly skewed by what's happened in the last few weeks, actually. So everything was looking quite rosy, but um, Vietnam has sold off a bit. Vietnam, Vietnam uh, Vena Capital Vietnam Opportunity hasn't really followed suit, but a large chunk of what it's invested in is unlisted, and so therefore it won't have been written down yet. So there's a sort of lag there um, in what's going on. Um, for those of you, I mean, we've we've had um, Craig on the show before, so you, you would have heard the story, hopefully. But um, it's a focused portfolio. It's got a very strong focus on ESG. Um, things like governance are important in, in a frontier market, generally, obviously. But it actually does put a lot of emphasis on things like environmental standards and um, show social aspects, too. It's not using gearing, borrowing. Um, so... Um, it's that makes it because the whole market's quite volatile. Um, it doesn't mean there's sort of double volatility going on. Unlike the um, the income for the opportunity, it's not listed and unlisted. It has got permission to do that, but it hasn't done that for a long time. Um, and it's also got a continuation vote coming up in 2023. Um, all sort of good tick boxes from a corporate governance point of view. Um, in terms of the results. So, yes, the um, NV fell in dollar terms, but the dollar, if you remember, is obviously being quite strong. Um, and it did outperform its benchmark, the Vietnam War Show Index, by quite a significant margin, so about 12%. So I think in local currency terms, it probably was just about flat. In sterling terms, though, which obviously um, all of us care about, the NAV per share was up 9% and the share price was up 16.8. So really quite not a bad return relative to what's been going on in the UK. Um, partly that was driven by uh, its increasing weight to large caps. Um, so large cap beats small cap. Um, but as we talked about the tender offer there, that, that, that did happen too. That was another 2% discount. So although there's a, there's a small uplift in the NAV because of that, that's not the by any means, the, the driver of what's going on here. Vietnam is doing particularly well, and there are a handful of countries around the world that are doing well in this environment. I mean, obviously, most of us are suffering. Places like uh, Indonesia, because of the um, resources that it's got. Uh, India's been seen to somehow decoupled from the rest of us. Uh, definitely that market's been powering ahead. Gulf states we've talked about before that we didn't show recently because obviously the high oil prices have been helping their economies. Vietnam, though, is another one. Um, and there are a number of reasons why. Um, one of the big ones is that it tackled COVID head on. So it had a, a very kind of harsh lockdown straight away. Didn't have any deaths in the first kind of wave of COVID at all. Um, and then it, it ran around getting its population vaccinated with um, Western vaccines. Um, and so therefore it was able to open up um, completely in April. Um, and that contrasts quite sharply with what's been going on in China, obviously. 
And that's one of the factors in an ongoing shift of manufacturing from China to, to places like Vietnam. Um, it's not really exposed to energy prices. Fortunately, it's got quite um, a good stock of hydropower plants, um, but it's also got wind and solar plants as well. So a big chunk of its power has been generated by renewables, and that's still growing. So it's not really as exposed to energy prices as it might be otherwise. Um, inflation is creeping up a bit um, from sort of imported things like fertilizer, but it's not out of control by any stretch of imagination. So it's it's currently in the, in the sort of two and a bit, and it's forced to rise to about three and a half, four percent by the end of the year. And because GDP growth is forecast to be about seven percent, we are saying seeing real terms GDP growth in this country, and it's one of the very few countries where that's being achieved. Um, it helps that over the past few years we've had this enormous foreign investment in its manufacturing base. Um, and you've seen announcements from people like Apple that they're going to build iPads there. Um, that, that whole thing just is just sort of growing and growing and growing. And then that means they've got a trade surplus. So that, that helps the currency strength. But domestically, it's also got this growing middle class, um, which is boosting the consumer sector and also the housing sector. Um, and it was quite badly hit by COVID and tourism, but that's coming back now quite quickly too. Um, and so that will all help in terms of growth. Where it has maybe got a problem is that because of this huge investment in manufacturing and everything else and the, the great growth of exports, it is exposed maybe to end demand if the global economy slows down. So prime direct investment is still very strong. So we saw a net 10 billion invested in the first half of 2022. But what we have been seeing in the past few years is foreigners selling the stock market. Um, and so they are generally underweight. And there's a perennial story that you've heard from us a couple of times too, that at some point Vietnam will be upgraded from a frontier market to an emerging market. And when that happens, there'll be a wave of money thrown in the stock market. Liquidity is improving, as I said on the bottom there. Um, that's really been helped by the number of domestic investors getting involved in the market. Um, but nevertheless, that, that wall of money will, will drive up um, prices when it happens. Um, in the short term, however, there have been a few kind of domestic scandals with um, sort of fraud and stuff that have unnerved domestic investors' enthusiasm from the market. And that's really why it's sold off despite the underlying picture being quite decent. Um, and I think the, the FT has got an article, um, actually it was yesterday, I said, I put this morning, I don't think I'm doing about yesterday. Um, they, they point out basically that, that this stock market is not expensive. So India is doing extremely well, but its most stock market is relatively expensive. Vietnam is trading less than 10 times earnings. It's the fastest growing economy in Asia. It's got everything going for it in terms of things like demographics. Um, and it's still got a long way to grow, even to catch up with China. So um, I, I think that there's a lot of ticks in the box. I'm getting chucks, lots of questions, more questions than normal. Um, Political situation, Vietnam seems more stable than China. Yes, I think that is true. Um, obviously, they, they are both ruled by the Central Communist Party. I think the, um, the Vietnamese seem to be a bit more pragmatic than uh, Xi, who's obviously been trying to consolidate power, and that's been upsetting investors. Um, chances of Vietnam getting emerging market status, um, I think that's relatively high. It's definitely growing. Uh, we've, so we've kind of dealt with that one. Um, is there another tender offer planned? I think that well, it kind of depends what happens with the continuation vote. I think that's the um, I think that's the next milestone. Uh, but I probably have to go and check that to be absolutely sure. Um, and is it a signature to PRI? I think it is again, but well, again, I'd have to go and check that. Um, definitely, it's doing doing all the right things. Uh, that's enough of Vietnam. Now let's talk about hypnosis, uh, which we've mentioned a couple of times recently as well, um, for various reasons. Obviously, the, the main reason why we sparked the interest in this is this complete decoupling of the NAV and the share price, which has become really quite extreme in the last few weeks. So um, the discounts widen now um, beyond 30%. Sometimes Morning has a problem with, with um, stretching its um, axes, but um, so that, that actually disappears off the bottom of there. Um, so 
end March, which is its last set uh, financial year, so its last set of accounts, um, it had gross debt of $600 million, uh, which on a net debt to NAV basis was about 25.4%. And it was paying interest at 3.25% over US LIBOR, um, which currently would mean it would be paying about 6.44% in terms of its interest. Um, that clearly isn't sustainable. If you look at these figures here, which is just very rough from the um, cash flow statement, um, suggesting that in the financial year ended March 2022, it was only a cash flow yield of about 5.4%, um, lower even than the, what it was earning in the year before. The cash receipts were impacted by things like lack of touring revenue um, because of COVID. Um, and there are a number of reasons why it's been accruing cash on its balance sheet, which again, we talked about last week a bit, but they are things like, there's been this huge dispute within the industry about what percentage of revenue that some writers should be earning. And that's now been resolved. Um, and so there's a, an accrued amount of money, which um, hypnosis is owed, which is in its NAV, but it's, it's still um, a wasting receipt from the, streamers people like spotify so so that should be coming through um and generally there's been this sort of time lag where they've been building the portfolio buying catalogs um and they they don't get the benefit of those for a full year um, but now because they haven't bought anything for a while we should get a sort of catch-up effects on that so i'm hoping i think everybody's hoping that the cash flow yield on this is going to be a lot higher um, going forward, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that if it isn't problems. So um, nevertheless, because interest rates are climbing and it's uh, relative to LIBOR, it had to do something about it. Um, and so therefore, uh, it's re renegotiated a new credit facility uh, for a five-year period um, uh, for $700 million. And initially that's on a kind of floating rate basis. Um, the statement that they put out that accompanied that said exactly that. In the course of investment policy, borrowings will not exceed 30% of NED. What we don't know whether that's a, a legal covenant in the terms of the borrowing or not. If it is, that's a, that's a real issue for it, but if the NED falls, because if it does, they'll breach that covenant. And the penalty for that might be that it won't be able to pay dividends, for example, until it's crude enough cash to rectify the problem, or it might be worse than that even. We don't know. So um, the next day, it announced it had actually managed to fix the cost of that debt. So um, it's at 5.71% up until uh, beginning of next year. And then uh, it's got a chunk, 340 million hedged out for the full term of the loan till September 27, and then another 200 million hedged to a um, third of January 2026. They're quite chunky rates of interest. Obviously, they're um, relative to what they were paying on the floating rate stuff. I suppose it's a little bit cheaper. Um, nevertheless, given what we've said about what it earns from its portfolio in terms of cash revenue receipts, and there's not a huge margin, uh, even assuming things are, are going to come back and it's going to be earning what it should be earning, there's not a huge margin over the cost of that debt there. So, so all of that catalog investment that it's done and the money that is borrowed, it isn't at the moment, it doesn't look like it's washing its face. Um, the hope would be that it definitely is um, going forward. But we won't know that until we see some more counts. And so really, we, we need to see what's going on uh, under the hood. We won't know that until they publish their September NEV. That would be around the time of their interim results, which were last year on 16th of December but they're probably going to be um, a week or so earlier than that, given them what they've said about capital markets day. So that's a huge body of uncertainty, um, unless they can find a way of addressing that earlier. Um, the discount now is 37.5%. On that basis, it yields about 6.1. Um, not great, but it's a speculative investment, I think, maybe at the moment, uh, which is unfortunately looks like Um but going forward, the one thing I suppose is whether you think that these these sorts of rates of interest 
are, are we going to see a sort of return to very low rates of interest in a couple of years' time, or are these new norm? We just don't know. If interest rates do fall, then it gets back into that situation that we saw back in the 2000s, early 90s, all that sort of stuff, where funds were borrowing uh, debt for long term, long periods at fairly high rates of interest and um, therefore having to make an NEV adjustment to reflect the fair value of the debt and also to reducing the NEV. Um, that might be a problem for hypnosis if rates come down, but um, only for five years, I guess. Anyway, that's in 